Hi, welcome to Makers Are Live. Every Thursday we go live at two o'clock Eastern time and we interview business leaders on how to start and scale their businesses. This week we're speaking about startup financing and startup budgeting and we're here with Pamela, a serial entrepreneur and founder of Br Brunch and Budget and she's here to talk about entrepreneur finance, personal finance, and business finance. So first, who are you and how did you get started on Who all am this? I? Wow, that's such a deep <laughs> question to start with. Hi, Facebook Live. This is my first Facebook Live, so I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> so I am, well, I guess I can start at the beginning. I'm Asian. I'm a girl. Um, I grew up with immigrant parents who told me that to be successful, I needed to get good grades and then go to good college and then get a good job. And so I told them I was going to be a literature major and they were so excited. <laughs> um, but I majored in literature in college and I actually, um, I taught financial literacy camps for kids in the summer and that's when the light bulb went off. And I decided that I needed to learn everything that I needed to know about finance and take it back and teach kids about it. So. I moved from Santa Barbara, California to New York City to get my foot in the door at a financial planning firm. And I, oh, I should talk to you. <laughs> um, at a I'm just here. <laughs> just asking the questions. Um, but at a financial planning firm, I worked in wealth management for seven years and really just got my foot in the door. I did operations. I did, I worked my way into doing financial planning. I got my certified financial planner designation. And in the midst of that, I was still, I was teaching kids, mm -hmm. I was going back and doing financial literacy workshops, and I was also having random people come up to me at parties and ask me, what's an IRA? Mm -hmm. Or, hey, I don't know how to manage my money, or I have all this credit card debt. And at some point, someone said to me, Pam, I know I need to look at my finances, but I'm really afraid to look. Yeah. And I said, why don't we do it over brunch? And she said, oh my God, yes, like a brunch and budget. And I was like, that's the name of my company. No, I didn't say that. But it really started off, brunch and budget started off as me trading financial advice for food. Um, it was really just a way for me to help out my friends. And it kind of turned into this thing where I, um, I do it full time now. Cool. And I guess that's who I am. I'm brunch and budget. And I think that financing and having... A budget is fundamental to any growing business or even as you start to think about growing a business what are some of the common questions you get from entrepreneurs in getting started and getting their feet wet when it comes to financing yeah absolutely uh -huh. just in general I feel like that the hardest thing is figuring out how to separate your business expenses from your personal expenses mm. and then also how to smooth out inconsistent income. Yeah. So those are probably the two biggest questions that I get. And I feel like the separation between business and personal finances can literally be as simple as open another checking account and spend all your business expenses out of there. Mm -hmm. You don't need to have an entity when you're first starting. You don't need to have a business structure and put that pressure on yourself or on mm -hmm. your business. Literally just a separation. Mm. Yeah, and then for inconsistent income, one of the things that I highly, highly recommend every entrepreneur do, everyone who's yeah. freelancing, is to do a 12-month cash flow projection. Okay. Um, I have a template that I can send you that you can send to everybody. But oh, cool. Yeah. Um, the 12-month cash flow projections, and I did this when I first started too because... I was working with a business coach and I was really freaked out about quitting my job, which yeah. I'm sure people feel. Yeah. Um, it was one of those moments where I was like, shit, I'm just not gonna have income for the first time ever in my life. Yeah. And my business coach encouraged me to put together 12 month cash flow projections just to see if it could possibly work. As soon as I did that and laid everything out and set some goals for myself, mm -hmm. I looked at it and I said, wow, I think I can do this. Hmm. And I think when you put it to paper and you take it out of your head, yeah. it not only creates these concrete goals in front of you, but it gives you an idea of, is the thing that I'm thinking actually going to work? Mm -hmm. And the answer might be, yes, let's do it. Or the answer might be, wait, I think I need to go back in and figure out how to make this work. Yeah. But you're working on it now. Yeah. And that just makes such a difference. And if you're, say that, there, I know that there's a lot of creatives um, that are a part of the Maker Joe community. If you come from a creative background and more of a design background, and you don't have any experience with budgeting and cash yeah. flow. Like cash flow projections sound scary <laughs> <laughs> to me. I'm totally. I like I have a finance background, but it still sounds. And you're like, like, like what? 
I have to do it too, actually. But it's even the words, like actually, the like word doing projection, it, yeah. right? You're like, shit, that's a finance. Doing word. it is a lot easier than it sounds. I think sometimes. So how yes. do, how do you work with creatives, and what type of like are there? Is there an easier way to like ease into it, or like what what tips do you have for people that come from creative backgrounds? Yeah, totally. I actually work with a lot of creative people, a lot of freelancers, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of artists, and I think one of the things to really think about is you don't have to know everything at mm-hmm. once. Mm-hmm. You just have to understand enough to take the first step. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that means getting help. That's why you know clients tend to mm-hmm. hire me. And sometimes that just means, let me learn one thing. Yeah. Let me open that business account and just start spending money out of there. Mm-hmm. And then, oh, it's been three months and now I have business expenses. Let me put those business expenses into something like mint.com and now I'm tracking my business expenses. Mm -hmm. And so when you take it step by step, then it becomes easier. And the idea of cash flow projections and doing this big money stuff feels less big when you've done all the other stuff before it. Um, I think that we tend to psych ourselves out, especially because I feel like that starting a business is like trying to birth a baby, Mm -hmm. right? I've never birthed the baby, but (laughs) I feel like that it's one of those things where you're so emotional about it and Mm -hmm. you want to get everything right and you want to make sure that everything's going to be perfect. And the reality is that's never going to happen no matter Mm -hmm. how much you prepare. So if you just take one step at a time and get comfortable with one thing and then move on to the next, Mm -hmm. then I feel like that's really the best way to keep going. Yeah. We use... um a, a firm that specializes in tech finance, but um, and we hired them pretty early on. When do you recommend an entrepreneur going from managing it on their own, kind of informally through yeah. Mint.com, and taking that step to make say, like hiring a professional accountant, hiring right? Who who should be their first hire or like freelancer that they should talk to when they're yes. starting a business and when is yes. that necessary? So definitely, hundred percent. If you have any self employment income, you should hire an accountant. I'm not an accountant. I'm a financial planner, and I have an accountant, and he does my taxes. Mm-hmm. But you should absolutely one hundred percent hire an accountant because it's not the same as employee income. It's not mm-hmm. the same as a W two that you can do through TurboTax. Mm-hmm. You're gonna want someone to actually proactively plan with you and help you handle the taxes as they come. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of freelancers get surprised by the tax bill at the end of the year, (laughs) right? (laughs) Because it's not automatically taken out every single paycheck. And so to have an accountant on your team right away to help you prepare for that, and they're not that expensive, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like they sound expensive, but they're not. But to have someone on your team to get you off on the right foot right away, so when you have that tax bill, you're prepared for it, will just set you up completely. Awesome. And what are some, what do you feel like are some common mistakes that entrepreneurs make when they're thinking about their finance, their business finances early yeah. on? Yeah, I think the biggest one that people tend to make, and this kind of goes back to wanting to make it perfect, mm-hmm. is trying to look like a legit business right out of the gate. Mm-hmm. Buying the swag, getting the co-working space, mm. you know. Oh, so like the frivolous spending. Yeah, and just like spending that you don't absolutely need to spend, mm-hmm. but you want to do it so that it feels like that you're bigger than you are. Mm-hmm. It's okay to be where you're at. Mm-hmm. And that's a mistake that I see people tend to make is to try and rush the spending. Mm-hmm. Um, I know personally that I wanted a co-working space the entire first year that I, that I was doing brunch and budget full mm-hmm. time. And I just like could not at the end of the day when I looked at my cash flow justify the cost. Mm -hmm. I could have just jumped in and signed one and said, I'm a real business person, let me Mm -hmm. get my own office. And I just, I just really, when I looked at it, I couldn't justify the cost. And I feel like that grounding yourself in what you're making and what's coming out really will make a big difference in terms of what you're able to justify paying for. I agree. And especially because there's, as an entrepreneur, some, I heard this recently was as an entrepreneur if you want to receive advice constantly become an entrepreneur (laughs) everyone will try to give you advice even if they've never been an entrepreneur like okay you have no experience (laughs) but like everyone will give you advice right and so it's hard because at the end of the day you're responsible right you have to make these financial decisions and a lot of you know, decisions that you make in an entrepreneur are financial decisions. Yeah. So it's, it's always challenging to, to make that call. What do you feel like is your, um, 
your go-to mentality when you're thinking about making a business expense or saying yes or no to a business expense? Yeah, is for me, it's been, um, do I think I could live without this in the next month? Mm. And then I just ask myself that every month. Mm -hmm. And I actually recently got a co-working space and it got to the point where I was not getting work done at home. Mm -hmm. I was working out of my home for a year and it got so distracting and so much of the work was piling on that I finally had to say, okay, I think I just need a space for myself Mm -hmm. and let me test that out. The other thing is to make sure that you don't commit to anything. To make sure that like if you wanted to get out of the co-working Mm -hmm. space, for instance, then you could. I also just recently hired an associate planner, for instance, Mm -hmm. where again, it got to the point where I probably could have used help a year ago. Yeah. But I waited much longer to actually hire her. And now I don't know what I would do without her. But I didn't have to, I hired her six months ago. And for the six months before that, I wasn't paying anybody. And so I saved that money so that I could know that I could make that leap. And I think that's really when you know is if you ask yourself every month and you tell yourself no, and then one month you're like, no, I have to do it. That's when you really know. And part Mm -hmm. of that is just like being really self-aware and not necessarily giving in to the things that you want. Like all this all this stuff that you want to buy is definitely going to make things feel easier up front, mm-hmm. but it's much better to do without at the beginning than mm-hmm. to have to end up folding the business because you ran out of runway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that mentality. So do I want this versus do I need this? Yeah. I like that a lot. All right, so we have a few questions that were emailed to us, and I know a few people are texting mm-hmm. in questions. So if you're receiving our texts, um, now is a good time because we're going to have a longer Q&A today because of the influx of questions that came in <laughs> via email. Um, so the first question we're going to tackle is from Alyssa. Hi, Alyssa. Hi, Alyssa. Um, how do you determine if a crowdfunding camp, if you should do a crowdfunding campaign versus slow growth with word of mouth and selling in small quantities? Ooh, okay. That's a great question. So I feel like the the main thing to think about is is it something where you need capital to actually create the product? Hmm. And if that's the case, then crowdfunding might be the way to go. Mm -hmm. So if it's something where you have this concept and you have a prototype and you feel like you can get people excited about it, then pre-sales means that that'll give you the ability to actually fund the creation of it. If it's something where you can test it out in small batches, Mm -hmm. I personally think that's the way to go because a concept is something where, you know, I mean, we've read The Lean Startup, we yeah. know about minimum viable products. The the promise that you're making to people in a crowdfunding campaign is something you have to meet. Mm-hmm. And so that's a consideration to really think about when you decide to do crowdfunding is you're telling people you're gonna give this thing to them. Yeah. People are committing money to you already to mm-hmm. do that. And so you have to be careful about the fact that you're making certain promises and making sure you can keep them. Whereas with small batches, you can continue to iterate yeah. every time you make a new batch. Yeah. And you can just keep testing it out and keep making it better and then maybe you get to the point where you're like all right I've done this enough times now I'm gonna crowdfund so I can scale the Mm -hmm. thing that I know is good yeah I I think that that's that's such sound advice because I I hear a lot of people wanting to test things out through crowdfunding where it's not the best grounds to test it because there's people behind that yeah there's expectations that you've set up yeah definitely also, if you're curious about crowdfunding, Jake Bronstein, who raised over a million dollars, did a previous Facebook Live. Ooh. And so you should check out his tips on that. Um, okay, let's go to Raven. Hello, Raven. Hi, Raven. Um, how do you get funds to pay for manufacturing your product? It's like a basic question. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess like let's explore the different ways that, yeah. you can, uh, that you can get funding to produce a product. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a couple different ways. One is you can take out a business loan. Um, so I believe that there's, I, th- I think I did a blog post on the website about um, financing your business and small business loans and things like that. Um, but a small business loan is a great way to start. It's actually because of technology and startups and all of that kind of stuff, it's actually gotten much easier to get a business Mm -hmm. loan than the past. Um, Usually banks were the only ones that issued business loans and you had to send in, you know, tax returns and cash flow projections and have assets and all this stuff where you're like, I'm starting a business, I obviously don't have any of this stuff. Yeah, or personal guarantees. Right, and it's like, I don't have any money because that's why I'm asking for money. It makes (laughs) no sense. You can have my dog. Yeah, Yeah, no, 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 pickles. Just kidding. (laughs) Pickles. (laughs) Um, But one of the websites 
websites that I recommend in terms of looking into small business loans is Fundera, F-U-N-D-E-R-A dot com. And they're actually a small business loan marketplace. So you'll do one application, you'll they'll qualify you for a certain number of business loans, and then they'll be able to offer you a suite of different loans oh, cool. depending on how much time you have, how soon you need it, how much money you need, and how good your credit score is, and all mm-hmm. of those kinds of things too. And it can range from you know, a small loan where they just need a bank statement to a big, like, small business loan Mm -hmm. where they need the whole, like, you know, the whole horse and carriage, basically. Yeah, so that's one place to start. The other thing, too, and I know this is going to sound crazy coming from a financial planner, but if you feel like you need money to get through the year Mm -hmm. and to get started, consider, if you have good credit, actually taking out a 0% interest credit card. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because here's the thing about credit. And I think that we are kind of taught, like, credit's bad, Mm -hmm. you know, don't have credit card debt. And I feel like it's really, credit's a tool. Credit's not good, credit's not bad, interest isn't good, interest isn't bad. You're basically Mm -hmm. paying for a service, right? Mm -hmm. You're paying to allow someone to borrow you money. So if you are deliberate about how you borrow that money, then taking advantage of a 0% interest credit card is actually great for your business. If you can find a 0% interest credit card that's 15 months or 18 Mm -hmm. months, and that's the amount of runway you need to finance whatever you need to finance, then it actually might make more financial sense to get the credit card, finance your business through that, and have a plan to pay it off. That's the critical part about all of this is Paying it, off. Paying it off. Yeah, that's yeah. what people. That, that's, yeah. that can be a little risky. I yeah. Think. yeah, and this is why cash flow yeah. projections are really important. Yeah, and knowing what your potential income is going to be, so that way you know in eighteen months, like, hey, I'm pretty sure I can pay this credit card back. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting advice. I don't think that I would have personally done the credit card route, but I think that, I mean, it depends. Like, it, it, yeah. like you don't have to. I think that generally. All you need is like five thousand dollars to get like a prototype and like a small That's batch the off the ground. So like five thousand dollars is too much, but I think it's you have to be. It's all about moderation, right? Like, yeah. I don't think that spending like fifty thousand dollars on your first line of you know on your credit, credit business, card, yeah, yeah, on your credit card right. is a good idea if you don't have an income, if you can't pay it off. Right. Well, I feel like but, that's uh, the other thing before you even think about funding and financing and any of this yeah. stuff. Know what your predicted costs are going to be. Like, understand this is how much it's going to cost mm-hmm. for a prototype. This is how many. This is how many of this I need to create to really test it and know if it's working or not. Yeah. And so again, it goes back to what do you want versus what you need, right? Mm-hmm. And really knowing like what's the minimum amount of money that I need just to do this part. Right. Your business doesn't need to be huge right off the bat. Yeah. That's not how businesses start. Yeah. And so by keeping that in mind and keeping your financing in check, I think mm-hmm. that'll help a lot. Um, all right, so Monique asks, um, I, in a place like Louisiana, how would I go about finding an investor for my collection? A lot of people don't believe in fashion and think it's a joke. Oh. And I don't have credit, so I don't qualify for loans. Mm. Ooh, Monique. Well, we love fashion, so. Yeah, first of all, <laughs> first it's not of a all, joke. It's not a joke. It's a real thing. It's a billion dollar <laughs> industry. Yeah, seriously. Um, um, that's a tough one. I feel like that if you don't have access to loans and you don't have great credit, I, I hesitate to say to try and find an investor because that means you're basically taking on a partner. Mm -hmm. You're basically saying, hey, you're giving me money and that means that I'm allowing you to insert your opinion into my business. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing when you take on an investor. It's not just a like, oh, here's some money, good luck. Yeah. Um, And I feel like that, especially for something like this, one, it's a matter of building up your credit and it's also a matter of building up your savings. Mm -hmm. Um, And so part of that is really just figuring out what can you cut back on personally and then what can you do with the extra money to start, you know, to start one line, for mm-hmm. instance. Savings is another way, it's like giving yourself a loan, mm-hmm. essentially, right? You're your own creditor, you're putting money away and you're saying, I'm gonna use this later for mm-hmm. something. And so if you don't have access to loans um, and you, I mean, I don't really recommend an investor, but if you don't have access to investors either, then that's probably the way to go. It's going to take longer. Um, and that's why it's also important at the same time that you're saving and you're building all of this up is to build up your credit, to build up your personal credit. If you don't have any credit at all or you have bad credit, 
open a secured card. Capital One has a great one. They're not paying me to say this. They're just great. Um, but Capital One has a secured card, and it only takes a year mm-hmm. to get your credit from in the 500s to in the high 600s. Mm-hmm. So take the time to really figure out, like, okay, what is this going to cost me? How much do I need to save? And how can I start building up my credit? And then within a year, you'll have way more options. Yeah. What do you think about grants and those types of options as financing as opposed to investors? Hmm. Well, I guess it depends on the stipulations of the grants because grants have their own um, ties, I yeah. guess. They have their own strings attached. Yeah. And so I feel like the grant, at the very least, you should be okay with what you have to produce for them yeah. to get the money. I think grants are great because you don't have to pay them back, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, and if you have access to that and they have grants in your area, then it's worth looking into. It's just a question of what what do they want for funding your business and not taking an investment from it. Got it. All right, so I'm going to try to summarize this. So, <laughs> Monique, uh, you can build up your credit. You can mm-hmm. do it in less than a year or in about a year. In about a year, yep. Sometimes um, faster. If you decide to take on an investor, you're taking on a partner. You're not just – you have to think about those stipulations. There's – the grant option. Um, we talked about c- crowdfunding before this, which I think is a pretty viable mm. option too. Yeah, that's true actually. Um, and then there's a, th- oh, and of course, building up your savings. So you can always get a job and <laughs> <laughs> eat ramen for a few weeks. We've all done then, it. And then build it up. Um, <laughs> okay, so a question via text. Um, from Shannon is I have included my own modest salary in my business plan. Oh, talking about building up your savings. All right. When do I start paying myself? Ah, That's a great question. That is a great Thank question. You, Shannon. Never. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the best way to think of paying yourself is, especially if you're doing it full time, um, or you make that leap, you're pretty much gonna be paying yourself. You're gonna have to eat. Um, unless you're <laughs> unless you're living out of savings, then you're most likely taking some kind of distribution yeah. from the income that you're making. When you start giving yourself a salary, that is a little bit of a gray of a gray area. So it really depends on. Um, honestly, the line is like a true salary is when you put together some kind of corporation, like an mm-hmm. S corp. And then you actually put yourself on payroll, you pay yourself a salary, you do bookkeeping. And that really doesn't tend to make sense for people until they're making, grossing $100,000 to $150,000. When you start paying yourself, probably as soon as your business is making money, you're going to be taking money from the business to live your your everyday life. Yeah, unless you have a really cushy savings. Yeah. Um, And then actually related to that, in terms of making that decision... Do you recommend, like, when do you recommend someone taking on, like, a freelancer or an employer? Or how did you even decide to take on, like, your part-time? Yeah. Um, I mean, how... start paying them. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. She needs money, too, it turns yeah. out. <laughs> um, so I decided to take on a an associate planner when I realized that if I continued like this, this is as far as the business could go. Mm. Like I could not. You felt like take, it was plateau, or like there was like yeah. a plateau with like your exactly amount of services. yeah. Like I could not take on any more yeah. clients unless mm-hmm. I hired someone. And I feel like that's a good way to think of it in terms of your business mm. is if you had to do one more thing tomorrow, could you do it or not? Mm. Or if you had to do one more thing next month to grow, could you do it or not? And that's really when I made the decision to hire somebody. And the thing about hiring someone now is she's freelancing Mm -hmm. so she's an independent contractor with me and I started at like four hours a week now she's at 20 Mm -hmm. so yeah so you can be very gradual about it too and again just say I think I need this much work from you and then you watch your business grow that month and you're like okay I can actually have you take on this much more work Mm -hmm. and then you watch your business grow again in the next month and if them being in the picture helps your business continue to grow then that's a sign that you should keep taking them on. Yeah, great. Is there another question? I'm gonna log on to Facebook. Um, yes. Oh yeah. Um, I need to calculate how much capital I need to start up so I can take a loan. Do you ask for a three month operating capital or do you ask for funds to pay for an initial production run? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, 
Is there a practical formula I can use to decide on how much I need? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination of things. So in terms of, it sounds like you might need to do both because I feel like that there's no point in operating without having the product and there's no point in having the product if you can't operate, right? So it's really a matter of what are the total costs that you need to borrow for three months. And then the other side of it is figuring out, okay, so I have in three months, what are my income goals? What do my income goals need to be? Like, mm-hmm. what income goals do I need to hit in three months to justify making this expense? Mm-hmm. And if that, if those income goals don't look like they're going to be met by actually borrowing this money, then you may need to go back to the drawing board. Hmm. Cool. Um, all right, there's one more. Um, what's the best strategy? Or actually, that one's a sub-bullet. Um, How do I find and approach potential investors? Ah, yes. (laughs) And I think it would be, because your expertise is in financial planning, when you work with clients that are entrepreneurs and are are approaching investors, what do they need in terms of of having everything packaged financially for an investor? And how how can they best approach their finances so that it appeals the most to investors. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I mean, we talked about this a little bit earlier and I'm not a believer in approaching investors when you just have an idea mm-hmm. or when you just have a prototype. And Is you, that for like a product-based business specifically or just I in general? I feel like just in general, if you haven't put your idea to market to see if anybody wants it, unless it's like a huge thing that you need a lot of funding for and it's a huge idea, then for the most part, it doesn't make sense to start taking on investors or asking for money because I think it's going to be much harder to prove that your business works if you haven't proven that you can actually sell the thing that you're making or the thing that you're offering. And again, it's you taking on a partner. Yeah, It's you taking on someone who's going to want to have a say at some point in what's going on, right? And that's why also I know that there's some product accelerators too mm, and incubators, yeah. which I think are a great alternative to investors. It's like the precursor. And it's a little bit more of what entrepreneurs need. Right. You know, I think in the right. beginning you need more of You need just support. the support. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you need someone. Yeah. You need a mentor. You need someone to talk you through like, is this going to work? hey, you should test this out here, hey, you should test this out there, and also connect you to people. So those kinds of accelerators will also get you into a network of other entrepreneurs, of alumni, of mentors and advisors who can really help get you to the point where you can do a pitch deck in front of investors and you can do that. In terms of the financial stuff, um, I feel like that it's, this is why I say like cash flow projections are one thing, right? Um, so when I did cash flow projections before I started brunch mm-hmm. and budget, it was all like a dream. It was all like, maybe this will happen. Wouldn't that be <laughs> awesome? Um, and I think that's how a lot of investors are going to see cash flow projections yeah. if they're only based on guesses. Mm-hmm. And so that's why it's super important to actually take this to market, see what people will pay for it, and then you have cash flow projections yeah. based in reality. And look at the cost, look at the margin. Yeah, yeah, look at what it costs to like get a customer. Yeah. You know, all of those kinds of things. Yeah. Cool. Are there any other questions that you want to go live with? Or should we just do make sure? Oh, yep, there's one more. Thank you, Carl. Um, Anthony it, via text is asking, if you are raising money, what should be considered to determine how long you should have operating expenses? Mm. Money. Yeah. Wait, so what should be considered to determine how long you have operating expenses? Meaning how much you should save up ahead of time. Oh, for operating expenses? As in, like, what kinds of things should you think about? Maybe, like, the components of that cash flow projection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, again, it all depends. Expenses. Yeah, it all depends. Yeah. So if you're someone who you're at a place where you need to have an office and hire staff, um, then you should consider those in your operating expenses. Yeah. I think it's really just a matter of, like, what are the different needs of your business at the time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. So what are the different needs of your business at the time and I feel like that I mean in terms of a runway is that what he's asking I think like because you spoke a little bit about cash like revenue projections yeah yeah yeah. but I guess it's like expense how do you like what's the other side of that yes well the cash flow projections the top is income and the bottom is expenses oh okay yeah Mm -hmm. so the income definitely matters but if you're spending more than you're making then your net cash flow is negative, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's really just a matter of 
okay, so I anticipate that I'm going to be making this much money. And I know it's hard to think about that because when you're first starting the first six months, the first 10 months, the first 11 months, you might actually not be making any money Mm -hmm. or you might have a negative cash flow. So by doing the cash flow projections, it'll give you an idea of what point am I breaking even and Mm -hmm. what point am I net positive. And so when you take into account what your operating expenses are, you look at what income you think you're going to be making, and then that'll give you an idea of, okay, so it looks like I need a 12-month runway before I'm profitable. That's how much money I'm going to ask for. All right, and there's a few Facebook questions. Oh, cool. Um, From Stephanie Jimenez, or Jimenez Stephanie. Hello. Hi, Stephanie. Um, What is the best option as far as hiring Contracting versus employees. Uh, Okay, so this is where it gets a little tricky because if there's only specific circumstances where you can take somebody on as an independent contractor. So there's a couple rules in place. Oh, that's true, especially in New York. Yeah, Yeah, so technically they are an independent contractor if they make their own hours, if they set their own rates, you have an independent contractor agreement with them. The only thing, just a good rule of thumb, is if you have an independent contractor, the only thing you can really require of them is the results. You can't tell them when to work, you can't tell them where to work, you can't tell them how to work, you can't tell them how to get to the results. You can just tell them, like, this is what I want by this day. Mm. Thank you, here's a bill. Yeah. Um, And so if you need someone to do more than that, then you need to actually hire them as an employee. Yeah, and that goes back also to having that support system and having actually hiring someone that can be an accountant and that can yes. help you with like talk clients. through that yeah yeah, yeah. And see like okay well does this person qualify or not right because yeah. at some point too especially with employees you're responsible for workers comp you're responsible for unemployment insurance you're covering half of their payroll taxes so it's a whole other ball game but there's a lot of people who need to be employees yeah. and they are hired as independent contractors and you will get audited for that and you will get in trouble for that. Yeah. So that's something to definitely watch out for. Um, all right. And Tati from Facebook is asking how Hi, much, um, co- how much would it cost for me to have a financial advisor? Oh, so that's it depends. Question. Yeah, that is yeah. a good question. So it depends. My prices are actually on my website and they're based on income. Um, There's a lot of financial planners out there now. I'm actually part of a network called xyplanning.com. And there's a lot of financial planners now who want to serve Gen X, Gen Y, millennial clients Mm -hmm. and actually operate off a monthly subscription model. Mm -hmm. So it's much more affordable to hire a financial planner now than ever. Like, for instance, in my wealth management firm, we are charging $15,000 a year. Mm -hmm. I charge a fraction of that based on your income. What's the range... Um, the range for me mm-hmm. so the range for me is it's there's an initial fee to actually put together the plan of 799 mm-hmm. and then between 99 dollars a month all the way up to 499 a month basically cool. and then there's also a 12 month commitment plan if you want to spread out the 799 initial fee oh interesting yeah so i think that we're seeing a lot more financial advisors and financial planners realizing like hey people don't have You know, people don't have assets under management, which is like having investments that advisors usually make money off of. And there are people who need advice on an ongoing basis that need to be able to fit it within their budget, which is why we're seeing a lot of monthly retainer models. Cool. Yeah, I think that's interesting how everything is shifting with this new era of entrepreneurship. Yeah. With like Kickstarter and Shopify and like all of these new entrepreneurs coming into the market. I think it's really cool. Yeah, me too. Um, so Lawrence, hi Lawrence. Hi Lawrence. Um, I asked, he asked the question about approaching investors. And so this is a little bit more detailed. Um, I've developed a five year plan with a hundred million in annual sale, sales at year five. My unit production cost is $50 a unit. I'll let you read it. It's a little Let's easier. See. Yeah. <laughs> I will sell. Um, I will sell retail for 100 so 50% margin. I expect my product to sell at 150 at retail. My idea is at the prototype stage. A retailer has already expressed interest, but I am worried that I will not have the funds to meet in order. Oh, that's why you're asking about approaching uh, investors. Ah, uh, yes. I, I mean, see. I think that um, we talked about this earlier, but just – if you need a lot of money for a big prototype, then it might make sense to approach investors. Yeah. But it is also a matter of, it's going to be a harder sell because you just don't have proof, you don't actually have the product. Yeah. Um, so it is about knowing the right people. And also, Lawrence, there's the, also the option of doing um, factoring 
which um, you can. I mean, oh. yeah, you can if you have a per, if you actually have a purchase order, you can get a factor, and they're gonna charge you like fifteen to twenty percent, but you can get it done. Just to get the first um, yeah, round out there, Yeah, just to get the first basically. round out there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's tough, but, um, yeah. But it's not, I don't think it's worth, retailers can be so flaky that, like, yeah, interest is a long way from actually having a, a purchase order in hand and then Having them pay you. Yeah, and then having them pay you. Because sometimes, like, I remember we had an order from a large retailer and they, it was supposed to be net 30. They ended up paying us net 90. Oh, my God. And it was, like, a big order. And so it's, like, <laughs> it's a really Two stressful. Months late. Yeah, it's a really yeah. stressful. Like, so you might want to consider yeah. first getting a few smaller boutiques to, to purchase um, your, your products and then approaching a larger retailer yeah. because – these retailers have chargebacks. It's a lot. It's a lot less glamorous getting a large order like that than it sounds. Yeah, and I mean, in this situation, if taking out a small business loan is an option for you, and you have the, you have the credit score for it, and the bank statements, and all of that kind of stuff, then it could be worth it to look into taking out a sizable small business yeah. loan. To look into taking out a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars, and then again, that way you're not involving an investor at a stage where you're not sure if you want an investor yet. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. Larissa is asking on YouTube, what requirements do we need to meet when trying to crowdsource? Hmm. Crowdfunding, I think. You mean, right? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. What requirements do we... I'm not sure what requirements you need to meet to crowdfund, actually. I know Kickstarter, um, Kickstarter reviews all of them mm -hmm. and actually approves them or not. I think with Indiegogo, it's just getting on there and doing it. <laughs> Well, GoFundMe doesn't have any. Either. GoFundMe doesn't have any. <laughs> you can other. go on GoFundMe for anything. Yeah, <laughs> for anything. Indiegogo is the same way. Yeah. So there are, Kickstarter is the only one that has a gatekeeper, I'd say. There are no real requirements. The biggest complaint that I've heard from people who've participated in crowdfunding on the other side as participants is that the product just doesn't get delivered to them. Yeah. And oh. yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, Carl has a question. A question from our live yeah. audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also based on this question, how I interpreted it. Yeah. Um, so before, and this is not just for crowdfunding, but also any business, how far along in planning should you be before you start seeking out investors? Do you, um, That's I was going to ask that, yeah. Right, right. I mean, I think, again, it goes back to can you not grow anymore? When you hit that plateau, when you hit that point where you're like, I need this much more money, mm -hmm. I need this much more help, I need this much more X, and I can't continue to grow my business without it, then that's the point I really feel like where it's time to consider alternatives and to figure out like what's the next stage. And you're going to hit that in your business. Mm -hmm. You're just It's hard to explain because you're just kind of going to know when you're there. Yeah. But when you get to that point, that's when you know, okay, it's time to seek out investors. And I think... That's why it's it's one of those things where it's fun to speculate, like, oh, maybe we should get investors, or how about if we involved an investor in this? But until it gets to the point where you're like, I can't do more than what I'm doing now unless I have this, that's when you know to take the next step. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think that it's not something that you should take lightly. And I think that with like all of these TV shows and like Yeah, Shark Tank. Oh yeah, it and like it glamorizes it really getting does. investors. But I think that the reality of it is that it's you know, it's a it's a decision. It's a big decision. Yeah. Um and so yeah, they like own part of your company, they own part of your decision making process. And so yeah. yeah, it's not to be taken lightly. Um okay, cool. Well we're gonna go to if there's any more YouTube questions or any all right, we're gonna go into the Makers Room Minute um, with, should, oh, oh, Avatar? Yeah. All right, oh. my bad. <laughs> <laughs> Rapid fire first. Oh man. Um, okay, favorite thing about New York? Oh man. Have you done Rapid Fire before? Is there, okay, I should introduce it. We are asking questions about you right. and about business. Got and it. And just, be yourself and say whatever's on your mind. Okay. <laughs> I got you. Favorite uh, thing about New York, yeah. leaving it and coming back. <laughs> Too real. Um, <laughs> best purchase. Best purchase of my iPhone. <laughs> I can't live without it. I know. It's terrible. Um, hidden talent. Hidden talent? I don't have any. <laughs> No hidden talents? No hidden talents. I can like do them 
I can do that with my tongue. <laughs> but I feel like a lot of people can do that. Okay. <laughs> um, <coughs> favorite clothing material? Cotton, definitely. Super soft cotton is like the best thing ever. Okay. I want my sheets to be made of that, all my t-shirts, everything. <laughs> Any pets? Yeah, I have a dog named Vinyl. She's a schnauzer pit bull mix. Nice. I know, so cute. Um, I'm a big fan of dogs. Um, uh, morning or night? Night. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. You seem I, like such a morning person. I wish I was. I really, <laughs> I've tried and just no, it just doesn't happen. Oh. I guess that's why it's brunch and not breakfast. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> um, favorite word? Favorite word? Uh, I know my least favorite word is moist. <laughs> I'm not going to ask. Gonna... <laughs> okay, worst fear? <laughs> My worst fear is dying. <laughs> totally. That's, yeah. I know. It's not public speaking anymore. It's dying. <laughs> Tea or coffee? Tea, definitely. Most embarrassing moment? Oh, man. I just... Uh, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Because there's a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do remember when I was a kid and bird pooped on me in the parking lot. And my brother just like pointed and laughed at me in front of him. That was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so intense. Um, uh, all right. We're going to cap it off with a really good one. I don't want to end this with a bird poop on me. <laughs> What's your sign? I'm a Virgo. <laughs> You're a Virgo. I'm a Virgo, oh, cool. yeah. Um, so, wait, is your, your birthday September, September 1st? September 1st. Nice. Um, all right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Totally. Thanks where for can, having me. Where can the Make a Joke community find you for your, all of the rest of your awesome advice? Yeah, I'm on brunchandbudget.com. That's A and D spelled out. And then I host a weekly podcast with my husband. It's uh, brunchandbudget.com slash podcast, and it airs live on Bonfire Radio every Sunday at 2 p.m., and then there is a re-air at, on Fridays at 7 p.m. We're 123 episodes in. We talk a lot about entrepreneurship and also how big-picture economics affect your wallet. So Nice. Yeah. And also check out Pam's blog post. We'll be sending those out or linking it within Facebook and YouTube. So check it out. Thanks so much. See you next week. Thank you.